Zwerf, the European Money and Finance Forum, bringing together policymakers, finance, and academia. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this Zwerf BNB webinar on monetary policy in times of crisis, a tale of two decades of the European Central Bank. We're very privileged today to have two of the authors of a new book, Roberto Motto and Wolfgang Lemke from the ECB, to present uh, the book called Monetary Policy in Times of Crisis. There couldn't be better authors than uh, the authors of this book. If you read the authors, there's the Director General for Monetary Policy. There are heads of division who have been dealing with these issues for many, many years. So we are really privileged to have two of the authors with us today. In order to further enrich and to provide also some uh, discussion and some criticism, hopefully, we have invited Stefan Gerlach from EFG Bank, former Vice Governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, and Sarah Halton, formerly at the Central Bank of Ireland, now just a few days ago having moved to the ECB, and Peter Pratt, a former ECB Executive Board Member and Chief Economist, Without further ado, I hand over to Roberto and to Wolfgang. Thank you. So thank you, Ernst, also for uh, your kind words. Uh, this is uh, joint work with uh, colleagues. Uh, you see listed them uh, on the front page uh, of the book. Uh, today, we are going to focus only on uh, two uh, chapters. Uh, of the book uh, and uh, but first of all uh, I would like to provide some background on how we came about uh, uh, to write this book. So why a book about the monetary policy of the ECB? The immediate motivation was the 20th anniversary of the ECB and we wanted to write something about the monetary history. So we started uh, and uh, it became a long paper, then even longer, and finally it became a book. But the real motivation was really to provide uh, an inside perspective uh, on uh, uh, the ECB staff uh, analysis and views, uh, often uh, uh, to the public, only part of the staff analysis might become available, of course, uh, a lot of it goes in the monthly bulletin, the economic bulletin more recently, in uh, working papers, uh, but uh, also to provide an organic view through uh, the years and decades, we thought that uh, this uh, contribution could be useful. We also provide uh, uh, some new analysis, uh, especially on uh, the unconventional measures uh, that were adopted in the last five years or so. And finally, uh, it became a contribution to the uh, review of the strategy of ECB that was carried out over the last two years, uh, and it was completed uh, uh, last uh, uh, July. Um, so what uh, we don't cover, let's say, in the book uh, is uh, the pandemic period, because the book was finalized before, and also we don't cover uh, the outcome of the strategy review, but as I said, this, what we do is was mainly an input into the decision. Now, in the next slide, uh, just for completeness, uh, uh, we see the chapters of the book. Uh, so the book starts from uh, the theoretical and historical foundations of the single monetary policy, it analyzes uh, the first few years, uh, especially the intellectual debate uh, around uh, uh, the new central bank and the new strategy. Then uh, we dig into uh, what can be one of the main themes of the book uh, that you see here in red, uh, and uh, will be one of the two themes we will focus today. And it's about uh, uh, how the ECB has operationalized uh, its uh, inflation objective. Then we discuss uh, the uh, global financial crisis, uh, the sovereign debt crisis, the periods afterwards. Uh, and uh, uh, in the last chapter, that again we will focus today, is uh, on the unconventional measures. Now, the next slide, uh, we uh, actually start uh, with uh, uh, one of the two topics of the, how the CB has operationalized the price stability objective. To recall, the treaty establishing uh, the uh, single monetary policy has uh, uh, 
establish the, the primary objective of the ECB is price stability. It does not define what means price stability and how to go about it. So in 1998, uh, on the eve uh, of the start of the single monetary union, the governing council provided a definition of uh, uh, price stability. And it was uh, uh, made in terms of uh, a range of positive values, so above zero, with a ceiling of 2%. And of course, the uh, historical motivation and background uh, was the high inflation of the previous decades in many countries in Europe. And uh, finally, uh, it was uh, uh, in all the euro area, you see here an aggregated uh, euro area uh, with a blue line. So finally, there was a control of inflation and uh, this definition of prestability was meant uh, to secure uh, low and stable inflation for the years to come. Now, in the next slide, uh, we see that in 2003, there was uh, a first uh, evaluation of the strategy of the ECB. And uh, the Governing Council uh, confirmed the definition of price stability as this range, but added uh, a new element. And uh, it was an aim, it was called an aim, quantified as below, but close to 2%. And here is represented with uh, a diamond. The main motivation also here, there was an historical uh, motivation. There was uh, uh, the deflation in Japan. There was also uh, some fear in some jurisdictions and mainly outside the EU area about uh, uh, the consequences of the burst of the dot-com bubble and probably low inflation to low inflation. So then it was felt uh, that uh, this level of being uh, close but below 2% uh, was creating a safety margin above zero, so sufficiently above zero, and it was within the definition. However, as we see in the next slide, uh, if uh, the aim is very close uh, to uh, the ceiling of the definition, if uh, there are sort of normal distributed shocks over time, uh, it will happen that about half of the time, uh, inflation will end up to be above uh, the ceiling, so outside the definition of price stability. And this might uh, give rise to an asymmetry or a perceived asymmetry uh, in the public and analysts uh, thinking that uh, the ECB might be more concerned uh, about uh, upside deviations uh, uh, above the aim than below the aim, because when you are below the aim, after all, you are still within uh, the definition for stability, as long as inflation is positive. Now, uh, in the next slide, uh, we see that it happened uh, that in the first decade of the ECB, uh, most uh, of the shocks uh, were upside inflationary shocks, uh, mainly energy, but also other kind of uh, uh, cost push shocks. Here, for simplicity, we represent uh, the energy uh, contribution. We see uh, the red line. We see also that refers to the right scale. We see the numbers, big numbers. So always upside pressure to inflation. And uh, so the uh, definition of prestability and the aim were really tested. So inflation always uh, been uh, uh, at and slightly above uh, the ceiling. Uh, and, uh, but especially when uh, we compare it to the US, so we don't do here, but it's in the book, uh, we see the inflation was uh, uh, roughly well behaved uh, in face of these uh, very inflationary shocks. So in the next slide, uh, we see how uh, this actually uh, happened. So how did it work in practice? So the, uh, in the book, we say that uh, the strategy was one important contribution uh, that they made uh, this possible, and uh, the strategy worked as it was supposed to be. So they're providing a strong anchor to inflation expectation. They remain always very well anchored below 2%, slightly below 2%, long-term inflation expectations. And uh, the ECB was able to control inflation uh, uh, via managing uh, uh, expectations for uh, future interest rates. We see in the chart on the left to give a visual impression also uh, 
with a red line, we see the actual change in the policy rate. We see that also when it was cut, so it goes down, we see the expectations for interest rates already one year out, and this is the blue line, was always above. And so it means that also when interest rates were cut, expectations were always for a reversal soon after. So in this way, uh, the, uh, the way the market was doing the central bank job and the central bank could afford uh, to uh, increase rates by less because uh, expectations of future interest rates were already provided some tightening. But again, how did it work in practice? So we say that one important uh, way was a kind of uh, open mouth uh, policy. And we see in the chart uh, in the right uh, with the red bars. So there was uh, always uh, uh, a language, an opish, an opish language of uh, uh, inflation concerns, uh, uh, second round effects, uh, uh, readiness to act. Uh, and this was interpreted by markets uh, as uh, uh, some tightening reflected then uh, in forward rates. Now, if we go to the next slide, we provide uh, then uh, uh, what we think is the implication uh, of this kind of regime. Uh, we see then uh, the, uh, the headline inflation is the solid blue line. We see also core inflation. Let's say that uh, as a definition of core is domestically produced inflation is the dashed blue line. And then if we especially we focus until uh, the global financial crisis in 2008, uh, we see that when headline was going up and especially above 2%, core was going down. So one up and the other down. So there was this negative correlation. This is not an artifact of a special measure of uh, core that we use. And for this reason, we show with the range, uh, the green range also in a number of measures of underlying inflation. And we see that they move together. So when headline goes up, then core goes down. This is suggestive evidence. And for this reason, in the next slide, we also provide some econometric analysis. And uh, um, as we are going to, to say, uh, we think of the ECB 20, first 20 years as a story of two regimes. One regime is, uh, coincides more or less with the first decade. And we're saying this was a period mainly of upward pressure, upward shocks to inflation. And uh, we see that when uh, there was this kind of shock, uh, these are input responses, we see the expectations of uh, uh, policy rates went up. We see in the first panel. We see the uh, inflation expectations, we see in the second panel, this is uh, the 10 year inflation compensation. They hardly moved. Uh, we see also the scale, uh, that is much smaller than the one for the interest rate. And so there was some uh, movement in short term inflation, but long term inflation didn't move. So then when we show the 10 year average here, uh, it hardly moved. And then we see in the last panel, uh, the core inflation went down. So this sort of validates uh, this uh, story for the first decade uh, that when there are upward shocks to inflation, headline goes up, inflation expectation are removed, core goes down. And we conclude that this, in a way, is a kind of necessity because uh, if uh, headline inflation has to remain uh, at around 2% uh, and uh, should not uh, uh, go above the ceiling, when there are strong up, upward shock uh, to inflation, given that the aim is so close to the ceiling, it has to be that uh, we need to make room for uh, this inflation pressure. And the only way is for core to go down. Wolfgang will now take over. Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a book with two decades, uh, two regimes. Uh, so we split uh, essentially the decades between the two presenters. So um, Roberto just wrapped up the characterization of the, of the first regime. And uh, so we have seen the 2% ceiling was a prominent figure in, in this discussion. And there were upside uh, shocks to inflation coming mainly from the supply and energy side. 
And if we switch now to the to the second regime, um, which is a slide that Roberto just showed, but now enlarged with what happened in the second regime, more or less we divided. I mean, it's real world, so <laughs> it didn't make it just directly within the uh, the, the midst of the 20 years. But so it's it's round about after the uh, great financial crisis, we see that um, the story shifted. The story shifted in the sense that the economic drivers were different. So while in the first part we had these high inflation supply side based shocks, the second half, uh, the second regime was more dominated by demand side shock that threatened to bring deflation to the to the other side of the spectrum. So there were disinflationary pressures. And you see Roberto's uh, stylized density here. So the say sweet spot of where the ECB said they want to have inflation within the definition of price stability. So definition of price stability zero to two percent, but within that the ECB aimed to be close but below two percent. That gave rise to this asymmetry here. So whenever something happened above the two percent, markets and, and commentators perceived okay the ECB may be strict to then then fight it. While in the second regime, where you're more in a low inflation period, you have a lot of probability mass looking forward, but also then, as we saw in, in realized terms, that inflation goes to the downside. So this is the, the lower end of the price stability spectrum, but in communication, it was perceived this has not been given so much prominence as the upside. So this this as a kind of a danger zone when you when you're above it then you get uh, the, the central bank comes up with a big stick that was less clear in the perception of the public uh, as regards the downside. So there was um, the as, as, as was recently written by by Bank de France, uh, Bundesbank and Roberto and colleagues in, in the Bank de, uh, Bank de France block that reviews a bit the, the current strategy review that in turn looks back on the history of the ECB. This period or the transition from the first to the second was a bit thought of as this is this sweet spot below but close to close to 2% became of a bit of a liability in this period here because it may have induced a bit the perception that CCB may not have a stronger reaction may have a stronger reaction to inflationary than to deflationary or disinflationary shocks and policy wise another uh, ceiling or another bound became now relevant namely the lower bound in interest rates because if you're with inflation at high levels you can always increase interest rates even more in order to, to, to curb activity and bring down inflation. But if you're at the low end, then at some point you run out of standard instruments. So the lower bound in interest rates uh, became, became relevant. And also, and related to it, you have a true risk that inflation expectations may slide. And there was evidence around, along the way. Because if markets perceive the ECB to become less equipped with standard instruments in the opposite threat to inflation, namely downwards, then inflation expectations may slide towards the low side. So this is, in verbal terms, the, the, the characteristics of, of the second regime. And as Roberto just showed our little econometric exercise for the first regime, uh, we did the same for the second regime, or essentially it is a, it is a regime switching model for those aficionados on the, on the call for, with econometrics. So it's one model that kind of found or turned out to, to also econometric wise identify these two, two patterns. So here, we look at a downward shock or downward pressure on inflation in the, in the second regime. And it turns out that uh, interest rate expectations um, are doing the right thing. So if there's a downward shock to inflation, markets think, okay, the ECB will lower rates. But you see already the impact, the average impact to which they, they think this will be the case is half of the size uh, that we saw in the upper regime. Yeah, so the size is right but it's less, the perception of what the ECB can do is less powerful. Secondly, as regards inflation expectation, Roberto noticed here, inflation expectations when actual inflation went up, went also up, but to a little extent. Here we see when inflation went down, it often triggered or tend to trigger a large, a huge effect, especially relative to the first regime on inflation expectations as measured by, by market measures here. And then this is in particular intricate, and I think this is also one of the things worse while reading the book. Roberto made this point of uh, core inflation giving, uh, making room in order to 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 uh, for the overall inflation to stay at two percent. So here in the first regime, it was when inflation um, when energy inflation went up, and you want to keep inflation at two percent overall. Core inflation needed to make room. Here it's a different story now. Here we have these 
really the spiraling effect. So if you have a downward um, impact on inflation, with uh, then also inflation expectations going down, core inflation would not do the opposite, but rather follow actual inflation and going down as well. So this is the kind of stylized representation of the two regimes. And here uh, in this slide, so we are in chapter six already of, of the book, we're in the middle of this uh, second regime. So we stand in the end of 2014. And uh, I don't give you the details here, but what you see here, this is a kind of um, internally often used, and then Peter Pratt will, I think, vividly remember it, a dashboard of the inflation landscape at any point in time. So by the way, this is one of the things that the book does compared to like pure academic books. I mean, we always try to reveal uh, ex post what ECB staff looked at and what was brought to the governing council in preparation of monetary policy decisions. So this is here just pure data, but made in a way to see a lot of things, namely where is inflation compared to the past? And here you have on the X axis various measures of inflation, backward looking inflation, um, core inflation, uh, forward looking inflation, our own forecast of inflation, survey forecasts and the like. And the point of this chart is here you have box plots, so the distribution of the respective inflation measure since the birth of the euro. And so the upshot here is whatever inflation measure you look at, forward looking, backward looking, core, you are always at the super low tail of it. So we were in a situation in 2014 where the inflation rate and the expected inflation rate was very far from where we wanted to be, close to but below 2%. And second, at the end of 2014, with a standard instrument, namely short-term interest rates, we were already um, at, um, at zero. Or if you take, say, the deposit facility rates, the ECB was even has already moved to slightly negative terms. So then the question arose, so given we want to get rid of this disinflationary pressures, what to do given the conventional instrument is constrained? And then came, and this is, uh, takes a large part of the book, namely in chapter, chapter five, so chapter five and six are kind of combined. Chapter five described what measures were taken and why they were taken, and chapter six is more the analytical quantitative impact assessment. So it's carefully described how these measures were discussed, but here's just a, just a summary. So the ECB, as, as the first major central bank, decided to go negative. So we introduced a negative interest rate policy in 2014 with uh, two steps of 10 basis points, and then eventually three more steps followed. So at the current, at, at the moment, we are at minus 50 basis points. And this shift in negative to negative rates had an impact on the yield curve at all maturities. So it was different, we argue in the book, and as other people do in other papers, uh, from a standard rate cut. And I will tell you maybe a bit more about the mechanism later on. But so the negative rate policy made it possible in the perception of, of market participants that the ECB is now opening up the room for doing this also in the future. So we had a stronger impact also on the long end of the curve. Second, um, there was a, um, a host of, of purchase programs. And as you know, the ECB first started quite carefully purchasing a bit of, of private sector asset covered bonds, uh, in particular asset-backed securities. But then when it turned out that the sheer volume of these bond purchases really insufficient to, to bring inflation up, in January 2015, then the governing council decided we have to also now do what other central banks do. We have to buy uh, government debt. So we, we started uh, purchasing sovereign bonds. So this is our QE program with the um, with the um, abbreviation APP as a purchase program. Then, of course, uh, once you do this, decrease rates even to a negative level, or you start a big scale as a purchase program. Uh, apart from the current rate and the current purchases, it matters, of course, big time what you tell the markets you will do in the future with rates and purchases. So both rate and a QE policy were flanked by very explicit and, and often changing and adapting to the environment forward guidance on the parameters of these two, two, um, two measures. And then, of course, you know, um, Europe is a bank based economy more than uh, in particular the US. There was a specific measure that uh, tried to keep up the loan creation on the side of bank. So to influence banks lending volume and rates. And this was our version of um, the funding for lending. So I say this because the Bank of England came a bit earlier with the funding for lending scheme. So you give particularly good refinancing conditions to banks if they do something useful, namely if they uh, if they give credit to the real economy. 
So these four measures were the kind of the key pillars uh, based on which the ECB tried to, to lift inflation towards, uh, towards higher levels. And then the whole book, or not the whole book, the whole, say, last chapter, six, is a bit of an assessment with econometrics, with, with qualitative assessment, and looking through various models on how the uh, measures impacted on, on inflation. And broadly speaking, we do it in, in two steps. So we first discuss in the book all these four measures together, how did they impact financing conditions? And here as a say as a token for financing conditions, it's a bit past pro toto, uh, that's just the impact on the yield curve. I'll tell you in a minute in more detail what, what this chart shows. And then in the second uh, step, we translate it to the impact on, on the macroeconomy. And um, so I think this is also something where the book differs a bit from academic papers. So academic papers, they're often interested in one specific aspect. So what do negative rates do? How much did Teltos uh, spur bank lending? How is the effect of QE? Uh, on a special variable, but we as central bankers and also like being liable to, to our stakeholders, the, the governing council, we needed to assess the whole package of measures like rates, forward guidance, purchases, telco together and seek to, uh, to quantify the impact on both financial markets and the real economy. So this is something that, that academics can eschew to not look at, but we kind of had to do it and we documented the book how we did this. So here in this chart is the impact of our three measures, NIRP, negative interest rate policy, FG, forward guidance, PSPP, well, yet another abbreviation. So I think we created a lot of not only liquidity, but also abbreviations along the way. So this is the public sector purchase program. So that's the, the um, public sector lack of, the, of our QE. And the three of them together, they brought down interest rates. Yeah, so this is the message of this, this chart. Without these measures, interest rates would have been a lot higher. So just focus on 2018 here. The last bar is a 10 year rate, and it means taking everything together, long term interest rates this is an average of euro area sovereign rates. Long term interest rates would have been about 1.3 percentage points higher in 2018 if we had not done these measures. The effect is overall higher for longer term rates than for short term rates. And you can see here a bit also the impact of the different programs. So blue is the asset purchases, and you see here a classical result also from, from other currency areas, especially from the US and, and the Bank of England. So if you do QE, you flatten the curve, meaning you have more impact on 10-year rates than you have on two-year rates. Negative interest rates is interesting. They had their strongest impact on short-term rates, but they have a much more distinct impact also on longer rates compared to standard rate cuts. And then forward guidance uh, also did its share. And if you look at the short end of the curve, you see, look, there all three instruments were actually needed to have a meaningful impact. So you cannot do with one instrument alone. And I think this was also an important discussion in the in the um, in the recent treasury review. Now, so we don't stop short at, at looking at the impact on financial markets. So this is the impact on GDP and inflation. Um, here you see also telco being included. You see there's a sizable impact of, of GDP. So this is uh, the blue line is GDP growth, so it's annual growth rate, how it was, say 1.8% in 2018. Dashed line is how would have it been if we had not done these measures, 1%, so we had almost 1% impact, positive impact of the measures on GDP. And also see here colorful, all four, four measures contributed to bring up growth. And finally, turning to the impact on inflation, the objective of the of CCB, you see a meaningful impact of 50 basis points in 2018. So inflation would have been 50 basis points lower without it. That's a, the point estimate. So you may say, well, 50 basis points, is it a lot or not? Well, if you're in a period of, of low inflation rate, 50 basis points is, is, is sizable. And you see here in 2016, if you take our results uh, face value, that would mean if you, if you, if you read it as, it as it stands, the measures by themselves made or helped that inflation does, did not dip into negative. Yeah. So the dashed line says without the measures, we would have had inflation, but in re reality we hadn't. And this is our estimate how the measures helped of avoiding deflation. So this uh, this brings me uh, brings me to the end, or rather Roberto and me to the end. So thanks again for the for the nice uh, invite. So this is 
400 pages in uh, almost 30, 30 minutes. So it's rare for academics to present books. So we just could give a, a small a small glimpse into, into what we did. Um, yeah, as Roberto already said, the whole book or the papers that preceded it were one ingredient also for the strategy review that was interrupted by the pandemic, but was then concluded this year of CECB. Um, a whole an emphasis of the book, as Roberto presented, especially was the, con the definition of price stability and then how to, to implement it as a central bank. And there you saw that um, the new strategy thought, OK, one learning of the past is that possibly the public, the financial markets, they're not really clear on what we want to achieve and especially not really clear about the, about the symmetry that we dislike high inflation and equally dislike low inflation. So there it came that the, um, the, the, the objective was, was cast into this symmetric uh, for, um, formulation. The council considers that price stability is best maintained. So price stability is given by the treaty by aiming for 2% inflation over the medium term and the commitment to this target is symmetric. Um, it is argued then that this new strategy is fit for all regimes. So it means when you are up, you, 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 we, we, uh, we try to, to penalize it with, with, with a measure so that inflation doesn't get out of control to the upside, neither to the, to the downside. And I mean, you saw, I mean, there's ample material already for a potential second edition. I mean, we have no, no intentions to do so, but the COVID crisis, as Roberto said, is not part of the book, but part of what we have as messages in the book on instruments flexibility, mixing tools rather than relying on a single tool. All this, I think, has been applied as lessons already when we took the uh, measures to fight the economic repercussions um, induced by the, by the pandemic. So let me stop at this point. Thanks again, uh, or thanks already for your attention to those people online. And thanks again for Ernest and, and team for inviting us and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto and Wolfgang. Uh, for this glimpse into uh, this rich, if I may call it, opus magnum on 20 years of ECB monetary policy. We now seek the view of the ECB governing council insider, Peter Pratt, who certainly has also views on this period, and I'm very much interested in hearing your yeah. take. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was fantastic to see you again, you know, Wolfgang, Roberto, and I don't know where the, the others, but I mean, I'm very grateful for the work you have done all over the years. I think the, the book, uh, really, for those who haven't seen it, the book is really excellent. I went through the last days and uh, I reread most of the parts and it, it's extremely well done, I must say. It's a very good balance between the technical aspects, which are quite interesting, I think, but also the narrative of the crisis is very well done, actually. Uh, it's maybe a little bit too... Uh, to logic, to structure it compared to the reality of decision making. So there's a little bit of expose, you know, putting in orders things which sometimes were a bit more chaotic. But I mean, basically, it makes sense. I mean, uh, the, the way it's, it, uh, the narrative is, is, is written. Now, I was a little bit surprised, uh, Roberto and Volgan, uh, that you stressed uh, this uh, regime one, regime two, in terms of uh, inflation. Uh, I you know, for the uh, Sintra conference in 2019, I was very, very hesitant in taking that narrative. Uh, basically, what you say is that there is a sort of basically energy shock, you know, lasting, persisting energy shock in regime one, putting some pressure on headline inflation. And if you want to get 2% or whatever, 1.8 or 1.9 or 2%, I don't care, but there is a ceiling then you have to compress the core inflation. Uh, but then the conclusion is uh, monetary policy has been too uh, tight over this uh, period. I mean, that's uh, ECB wants to communicate to the public, but the public would then immediately say monetary policy has been too tight. And there is a, another dimension, which don't forget that I was uh, 11 years before coming in central banking, before coming to the ECB in regime two, I came in regime two, uh, but all the imbalances that we had in regime one period are a little bit uh, underplayed, you know, under, you know, discussed in the book, I think, uh, because that would have meant, if you say, we, need, we would have needed more expansionary monetary policies, uh, 
in regime one, probably in terms of financial stability, you could even have exacerbated uh, the tensions, the imbalances we had there. So I think the biggest weakness in uh, regime one was not so much this definition of price stability, although I think it's a good point and I think it was very important to fix it. But I think in regime one, the biggest failure actually was the question about you know, financial imbalances that led to the banking crisis all over the rest of the period. I mean, and, the, and I think uh, I know I can testify because the first war game was done in 2003. I was uh, not yet at the ECB, of course, uh, and uh, with uh, colleagues from, from the ECB, we prepared the first war game. And I can tell you in 2003, it was absolutely not allowed in the war game to go uh, into uh, scenarios where big institutions would fail. It was basically a liquidity shock, and it was to test communication across central banks, you know, to provide liquidity. And uh, I remember that as a trauma uh, uh, because, you know, I lived, you know, in 2008, the big banking crisis in Belgium, and I saw it coming over the years, over the years, years before it came. Now I couldn't do anything, so I'm responsible in a way. Uh, but I, I, I think this is the biggest, biggest failure, and we pay still the price today, so that, that, that part. I think it's really excellent in the book, I think, this idea of separation. When I came in 2011, uh, I, I saw, uh, well, and, I, and I followed, uh, but basically saying there is a difference between the stance uh, and liquidity provision. Basically, when you had the banking crisis, it was to say, well, provide liquidity. There's nothing fundamental, but it's basically something in the US, a bubble, you know, blowing up. And uh, so the fundamentals are not really bad, except a few peripheral countries. But I mean, basically, the situation not that bad. So you provide liquidity, separation, as much as needed. Uh, but the stance can be different. That's how in 2011, you can increase the rates and at the same time provide liquidity to the banks. I think this is one of the biggest failure is not to have identified on time. It's not because you increase the rates in 11. It doesn't really matter very much. But I think the biggest failure is not to have understood sufficiently early that there was a huge legacy from the crisis and that it was not only a question of a few peripheral countries, but it was a, a really something rotten in the whole you know, transmission mechanism of the union. And of course, the excuses for the ECB is that there was no banking supervision. I remember very well in 2011 when I came and there was a decision to provide dollar liquidity to the bank to, to the banking system at very cheap rate because if if you do it at banks it's not in your book I, I haven't seen that in the book by the way but if you provide it at very expensive uh, rates uh, dollar provision nobody is going to come to you because of stigma so you give it at cheap conditions but uh, when you take these sort of decisions uh, and it's normal it's not in the book because uh, there was no information there was no responsibility in terms of uh, banking supervision at that time. And uh, so uh, a lot has happened in learning, uh, unfortunately, because of a crisis. Uh, uh, and the situation, I think, now is extremely improved compared to what it was at the time. But to come back to your presentation, which is a, is a very interesting point, but because you compress the, rate, the, the core, because you know this persistent. And then when you go in the other regime, when you have these inflationary forces, China, you know, oil prices going down and persistently lower, then of course you hit the lower bound. So you would like to lower the rates, but you don't have enough room. So that's the story. So the summary of the 20 years is that policy has been too tight over 20 years, which cannot be the story. It's a caricature, I, 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 I admit, but it cannot be, it cannot be uh, the, the, the whole story. Now, the, I wanted to say, uh, because I promised to be extremely short, so I would have called the book more uh, not a crisis, but it's under uncertainty because the it gives a little bit the impression that uh, the crisis starts, you know, after 2008. But I think uh, basically there was a regime change with the euro, and it was very difficult, as explained very well in the book. It was very difficult, you know, to manage monetary policy for an integrated area. When I came in the ECB and I don't know if Wolfgang, Wolfgang Schill, who was there at the time, you know, leading DGE, uh, I made a presentation, I remember, uh, stressing uh, when I was chief economist, that means early 2012, uh, yes, 12, 
uh, I made a presentation where I showed situations in different countries. And I remember one of the reaction of some of the staff was to say, this is not to do because, you know, we do monetary policy for the euro area as a whole. And showing divergences across the countries was not, you know, something you would do. The idea was that when you, when you create the euro, you have to forge, you know, this euro mindset and not this nationalistic sort of view. And so you have to push in one direction. Now, of course, there were huge imbalances all of these years before the financial crisis. And there was a tendency, you know, not to look too much at the potential consequences of these on your monetary policy in general. Uh, and of course, the excuse of the ECB is that the, the, the framework, the monetary union framework was extremely incomplete, you know, uh, and we know it today, we, we learned it the, the very hard way. Now, last word for the staff. Uh, I think uh, first, I mean, they're excellent. I mean, I can testify and the book, I think, testifies. They're really excellent and uh, it has been a privilege for me. Uh, it shows the, the key, you know, the key, the, the role of an analytical, you know, work uh, for decision making. Uh, it is not, you know, things where you say, well, I'm going to do QE. I mean, it's, it's extremely well based, you know, uh, and there's a lot of work behind that. Uh, and within the work, uh, I want to stress one point, which comes very often in the book, is understanding market prices in general. Uh, Volgang in particular, you have been, I remember, continuously looking and trying to understand market prices. It's a very difficult thing to do. For example, if you look at oil, I, I, and then I finished, if you get oil prices, uh, you have to look, you know, oil prices go up. Is it good or bad news? Well, in a way, it's bad news, of course. But if it reflects, you know, aggregate demand, which is strong everywhere in the world, and oil prices go up, it's not the same if it's, you know, it's a supply story, uh, uh, you know, supply rationing or whatever. So all these guys in the ECB have been crunching the data to understand. And still today, and this is, this is a point I wanted to stress, uh, still today, when you look at long-term rates in Europe or inflation expectations in Europe, you try to, uh, Volgan, you try to disentangle, you know, the long-term rates, the 10-year, and then you have four basic, or more than four, but basically four components, the expectation part, and then you have the premium part, the risk, you know, all the risk distribution part and the liquidity part. So they're basically three. And you do that for the, for the inflation part and for the real, the real rate part. When you look at the communication uh, now, now of, the gov of members of the governing council, there is a lot of confusion uh, in the communication. It's not that they are confused. It's that it's very difficult to interpret the data today because when the real rates are negative, what sort of signal do you have today? Is that because the markets expect, you know, that growth is going to be bad in the future? Is it more the risk premium, uh, which has changed very much? It's very difficult to disentangle the figures also given, you know, uh, liquidity issues in that sort of markets. And uh, I think the book, I think, is quite interesting for researchers to focus a little bit on that to understand market prices because monetary policy tries to influence expectations uh, and then when prices react to, you know, what you would like them to react, you say markets understand our reaction function. And when it goes the other way, then they say either they don't re understand our reaction function and that I, I correct in one way or the other, uh, or not. And so you have a two-way street between markets and uh, policymakers, which makes it extremely tricky to interpret market data, as you know. And, and when you, look, you want to look at the efficiency of policy, it's very difficult, and that's why the techniques are so complicated. You want to disentangle the effects, you know, is it the market's understanding early enough the reaction function, or is the governing council reacting, you know, to the markets and correct its reaction function. You know, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-way street, which is extremely complicated. And that's why some, I think some researchers outside the central banking, well, not all, the central banking community concluded, uh, you have seen the study, that what you did uh, was biased. That you uh, basically find big effects, or bigger effect than it's not central banking analysis. I have strong re reservation, and I, I was very upset to read that, uh, because I, I, I don't think I ever had uh, any pressure on the staff uh, to come with biased results. So it comes you know, from the staff itself or its expectation of you know, how you receive by the governing council. But our 
our attitude, uh, and it's certainly my attitude, but I think also for my colleagues, was to give a lot of freedom to the staff to do the best they could, you know, in, uh, in uh, bringing material for the governing council. And so uh, was the staff uh, too creative? It was very creative, too creative. Well, some, that's another criticism you hear sometimes, too creative, you know, with. Not critical in options. I think you both really start. In the book, you say. Peter, I'm sorry, we cannot hear you anymore. So maybe we use this opportunity uh, to give Roberto uh, and Wolfgang the opportunity to react to Peter's very rich points. Maybe you can keep it to five minutes so that we have sufficient time for the other discussions. Sure. Roberto, will you start? I have a couple of points, but maybe you start. And, uh, uh, and sharing also uh, sort of your views. Uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, um, no, yeah, I would say no. Thank you very much for your comments, uh, your insights, uh, and uh, perhaps. One point, uh, uh, just to clarify, given there is a book on monetary policy, we are focused on the aspect uh, that is very much under control of the central bank. And this is uh, its own strategy. Of course, uh, uh, would be, as uh, uh, you said, would be a caricature to say that what happened was because uh, of the CB strategy. So the main failures were elsewhere, uh, and and you rightly pointed to uh, the lack of uh, uh, the more of a micro macro financial uh, uh, um, policy. I would add also probably the fiscal side, uh, uh, the weak fiscal framework, uh, possibly and structural issues. So these were the main uh, issues. What we say is that uh, in the first decade, uh, uh, the uh, policy of ECB was very successful uh, in the sense of controlling inflation. However, as a reminder for like a, like for, for central banking practice and and, and analysis, uh, that there is often like an intertemporal trade-off. So perhaps uh, some of the success uh, in the short to medium term might come uh, by uh, like weakening uh, the uh, situation further out. So this uh, is something that uh, in the design of, uh, for example, uh, the strategy of policy measures, something that should be always uh, uh, taken in mind. Uh, regarding uh, uh, uncertainty, yes, actually, uh, it was a very good point, and uh, I think that one of the initial titles had uncertainty, but in the second line of the preface is saying that what we want to do is to talk about uh, central banking, macroeconomic insecurity and crisis. So insecurity mm -hmm. is very much the uncertainty because we should not forget, I mean, here we pointed out perhaps uh, some elements that could have been better. But we should also focus on the other side that coming from really full uncertainty as establishing a new currency area, new like the euro, it was successful in anchoring inflation expectations and, and but also in the logistic for changing the bank. So I mean, all the project was so successful and uh, this is mentioned in the book and we didn't mention representation, but of course it should be mentioned. Perhaps Wolfgang. Yeah, just just one one minor thing. I mean, uh, of course, I agree with Roberto on these things. I mean, you mentioned analytics, uh, Peter, and I think this is important. So the, I think this adoption of analytical uh, underpinning of research and especially also in the monetary policy department of the ECB, I think that was embraced from the start with the ECB. And I think this is super useful that you mentioned one example, namely this is understanding of financial market crisis and making sense of it. And I think here is really a difference to academics because academics, they can pick what they want to analyze. As a central banker, like in, in our shoes or my shoes, you're constantly asked what to make of it. 
and sometimes you just cannot like on a on a daily change or so so this is really a mm -hmm. i think we tried also a bit in the book to to emphasize this is a specific type of of challenge that you have as an academic analytical central banker and um and then communication of course is a challenge there and you have to be careful not to get trapped in this hall of mirrors type of, of logic and maybe just on your last reference i think you mentioned this 50 shades of qe paper so we are not in there um and i think but roberto may correct me our macro effects are really on the more on the moderate side. So in that range that they look at there, I think we were not on the high side. So we would have not even been um, suspicious in, 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 in their view. But I, I agree with you otherwise. Thank you, Peter, Roberto and Wolfgang for this first round. We are now switching to Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Ernst, and hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. So yeah, so let me just start again by saying thanks to the organizers for, for inviting me. It really is a pleasure to be able to discuss what is, you know, a very interesting and, and really important book. So just by way of background, as, as Ernst said at the beginning, um, I am looking at this from the perspective of someone who's worked in central banking and monetary policy, both in a national central bank in Ireland for a number of years and then um, in the ECB as well. So obviously my views are only my own and not of the institutions, but they're definitely from, from that lens. So, I mean, if I can start really just with my kind of first impressions of the book. Um, so, the, so, like really overall, I think, you know, the book definitely provides a very interesting and um, clear narrative um, matched with sort of technical rigor. And um, so I think like one of the great achievements of this book is the fact that it's in its very short life now seen as a very key part of, um, you know, a key reference for monetary policy and for anyone who wants to learn about monetary policy in the euro area. And I think also the combination of having this technical rigor there with the narrative of the historical documentation of these events is really what makes it a beneficial text for both experts and non-experts alike. And also, I think it's worth, you know, reflecting on the fact of the period that it covers. I mean, it's not exactly a, a tranquil period, the whole period, especially the second half, as, as the authors say. And I think it's a great achievement that they were able to glean such clear messages and communications from uh, from this time. And to, um, oh, excuse me, I don't know why my, excuse me, my, to use the words of um, uh, the German writer Hermann Hesse, I think, you know, he says that to study history means submitting mm -hmm. yourself to chaos, but nevertheless retaining your faith in order and meaning. And mm -hmm. I think it's commendable to the, the authors that they were able to achieve this. They, they were able to make order and meaning out of what was a very turbulent time. So that should be recognized. So really, like on the basis of this, um, what I want to kind of discuss today is, is, is really bring some kind of, I suppose, slight critiques of the text, but also just to prompt a bit of a discussion and to get the author's views on um, communication and monetary policy. So obviously, um, Peter touched on some of those elements there. And the reason I'm so interested in this is that in the recent um, ECB strategy review, <clears throat> I was on the work stream for, for monetary policy communication, which looked at both the communications elements, but also the kind of effectiveness of monetary policy and assess them over um, since the last strategy review. And, you know, the findings of that paper are all documented in, in this occasional working paper series that I that I quote there. Um, and so another element that I think the reason I want to focus on communication is also because I was part of this work stream when at a national central bank and as part of the strategy review, um, you know, we met a lot of civil society groups and members of the public. And so it really became apparent to us, like how differently monetary policy is perceived and um, the different expectations of different civil society groups. Um, and so I think it's a very important part of, of our policy. So before I get into the discussion, I just think it's helpful maybe to recall very briefly um, the two broad aims of, of monetary policy um, communication. So obviously one aspect, which is quite distinct, is really to kind of around accountability and independence. And it's its purpose in terms of enhancing transparency and credibility and trust among the public. And then there's another element, which is really about the effectiveness of actually our measures, how monetary policy transmits through the economy and influences ultimately financial market expectations and expectations of firms and households, because obviously that's really then how their behavior changes and ultimately what affects output and inflation. So, Obviously, both of these points are extremely important, but I'll probably focus um, more on the second for the purposes of the discussion. 
So to get back to the book itself and what it says about communication and monetary policy, I mean, I think it's a thread that runs very clearly through the book that it's recognised how important communication is. I mean, I took this, this sentence already from page six of, of the report, which says that, you know, communication by the Governing Council was useful, particularly in the first 10 years of monetary union. I've been able to contain sort of inflationary um, impulses. Um, so it adjusted the forward curve without actually needing a change in the policy rate. So I guess this sort of would um, speak to what Ben Bernanke said, which is that monetary policy is 98% is uh, talk and only 2% uh, only action. Um, and I think the book very nicely covers, you know, for guidance. And I know um, we just saw there from Roberto and Wolfgang um, very nicely documented the quantification of these effects vis-a-vis -vis also the other measures. And I think overall, the, the study does show that, you know, this was a policy that was very successful in, in coordinating investor expectations. So particularly in chapters five and six, it goes into this and assesses this. What was missing for me from the book um, was this kind of talking about communication with the broader public, firms and households, and whether and to what extent at all, if this is, if this is relevant. And the reason I think it's important is that one of the conclusions from the, the recent um, uh, ECB uh, strategy review, so the occasional paper with the findings of, of the work stream on monetary policy communi communications was that indeed the euro system's communication policies um, have focused and actually quite successfully on expert audiences, um, but there's sizable scope um, for improvement vis-a-vis -vis the wider public. So just to give a little bit of background on, on this statement, um, so in the course of the strategy review, um, I carried out a, alongside um, Michael Ehrman and Danielle Kadan in the central and the ECB and Gillian Phelan in the Central Bank of Ireland, an anonymous survey of former governing council members at the at the ECB. So it was sent out vis-a-vis um, -vis the, with the secretariat here to all former members, um, and we got a response rate of almost 60%, which is not bad, we think. But really the purpose was to be able to glean really what the perceptions of policymakers were about different communication practices. So uh, Stephen Cicchetti did a similar study for the US, so we thought it'd be interesting also to take this opportunity to do it for the Euro area. So the slide here shows some findings from that that might be interesting in the context of my comments really on the book. So you can see the slide here shows the responses on questions regarding uh, the importance of communication with different audiences on the left hand side and the adequacy of the current communication practices with different audiences on the right hand side. And how you would read it is that um, these are sort of diffusion indices across the different responses. So. Um, respondents were given an option on the left-hand side to say five response categories, either very important or not important at all. And if, you know, a figure of one on the left-hand side chart would have meant that everyone said that this was extremely important or very important. Um, and similarly on the right-hand side, if, if a value of one on the chart would indicate that um, respondents thought that there was, uh, there was completely adequate, the current communication practices. So what this chart is telling you very clearly is that you can see that the people themselves who were executing and implementing monetary policy, the, governing, the former governing council members, recognize that or, or perceive that communication with financial markets is, is by far the most important. Um, so about 85% had said, um, so this is obviously a diffusion index, but to give it in percentages of the different response categories, 85% said that it was extremely important, whereas only whereas less than 50% thought that um, communication with the general public was extremely important. But also at the same time saying that, you can see that on the right-hand side, the same group of people did acknowledge that um, there was most room for improvement really with the, with the general public. Um, and whereas currently uh, communication with financial markets and expert audiences, you can see there also is, is, is rather adequate at the moment. So this is also confirming that this is where there is perceptions of, of room for, for improvement. So with this in mind, um, I'd be interested in hearing from the, from the, the authors of the report, kind of their, their thoughts or their reflections on two questions. So first of all, I'd like to know, um, you know, the fact that I suppose maybe households and firms and the expectations and communications with this group wasn't so much in the focus is not surprising when we think of the results also of the survey that we carried out. It seems to be a general perception. 
Um, but like, really, I'd like them maybe to talk about, you know, there are two sort of debates around this topic, you know, I think that's why it's interesting to think about. So I think it's clear that, or well shown that households and firms do tend to have be, you know, sort of rationally in attention, have that rational in attention to inflation and monetary policy, particularly when inflation is low, it's not a concern. And also there's a lot of evidence to show that their expectations and even perceptions of inflation are quite uh, disperse and even um, you know, less accurate than financial markets. And, and oftentimes they perceive inflation to be a lot higher than it actually is. And so given the, these facts, um, some people assert that in fact, household and firm, firms expectations don't really matter, that you know, maybe it's not worth our while trying to reach out to this group and move them. You know, it might be worth communicating with them to enhance trust and credibility and kind of foster accountability. But in terms of effectiveness of monetary policy, these expectations matter little. And there was a paper by, by Jeremy Rudd, I think, that garnered quite a bit of attention earlier this year that sort of put forward that view. But there is at the same time, you know, really a, a large literature that still hangs on to the, the, these expectations being important um, and therefore communication with these, these sectors being important. I mean, I think I highlight just one paper here, but there are many, but this is by um, colleagues from um, the Boston Fed and also from um, Bank de France that show that while the exact inflation rate that people expect is not necessarily very informative, it's really the broader inflation regime that they expect and also their perceptions about how the health of the economy that's important. And so that brings me to my second question that I'd like to hear their reflections on, and that's how can communication with the public be approved upon? So given that you know there's evidence that agents can react in unexpected ways to news about inflation, and what I mean by this is that households and firms can hear about an increase in inflation and perceive it as a supply side shock. So see it as being you know um, an indication of a deterioration in the economy. And this, there was a very interesting paper by um, Kandia Koibian and Gornachenko last year at, at Jackson Hole that said that, you know, given this fact, it's very important when communicating that central banks look beyond just talking about inflation and interest rates, but talk about the broader economic consequences, the labour market consequences of their policies. And also there's a, you know, and uh, there's an interesting QJE paper that I point out there that also, um, you know, really underscores the importance because agents can incorporate kind of broad uh, information about employment into their kind of decisions and expectations better than they can about, uh, you know, information about QE, for instance. So, I mean, I think I can stop there and just leave the questions really and um, give them a chance to to respond to that. And, and also just to think, I mean, are there particular challenges for the euro area? I mean, I think for the US where they've got a dual mandate, of course, it might be a bit easier to communicate. Um, on you know employment when it's when it's directly in their mandate and is there any ways we can get around that given the importance of kind of the economic perceptions um in people's reaction or in people's reactions to monetary policy so i'll stop there thank you thank you sarah roberta wolfgang second round of answers who wants to start Hello. uh thanks a lot sarah for your uh insights uh, uh, in the interest of time uh, um, let me just pick up a couple of things uh, uh, one is like what we do and what we don't do in the book in the book we have uh, a long discussion about one issue you mentioned there is uh, the uncertainty about the inflation objective uh, uh, let's say the target the numerical target uh, and how important that might be we report all the discussions uh, starting since 1999 and actually one of the bottom line of the book i would say is uh, that it's very important to have a clear like numerical target that everybody understands uh, the other thing that we do is uh, uh, regarding uh, the impact of communication so um, how best to assess the impact uh, this uh, was uh, uh, an important element uh, when uh, we had to quantify the input for our guidance and so this motivates uh, the choice uh, we finally made uh, not to use for this part of the book uh, uh, the sg the natural equilibrium models uh, uh, that might tend I mean, standard yes models might tend uh, to suffer for what is called now a forward guidance puzzle so to exaggerate the impact of uh, central bank communication and we took more of an empirical approach uh, uh, what uh, we don't do in the book uh, 
is to look at how different uh, uh, groups uh, might have uh, interpreted uh, and what else could have been done. We don't discuss this, but yeah, as uh, Sarah mentioned, this was a very important topic in the review of the strategy. A lot has been done also before, I just recall the consumer survey. Uh, we have also uh, a firm survey, and then we do, I mean, we target also banks or financial analysts, and, and, and I think the future much more so the broader public. Then I can possibly say my own views on this, but perhaps leave, leave it for the end if we have time, uh, so then we can hear also uh, the remaining questions and discussion. I would also add only my own views on this. Uh, thanks, Sarah, because there were super interesting comments, uh, but leave it to the end. I'm just maybe one thing to pick up. I think this two tier uh, communication is, is important and difficult. So if you speak on the one hand to financial market experts and say the general public, and you see from if you just follow the ECB website over time, especially after the strategy review, but also before you see a constant say reconsiderations, how do you reach these different levels with different type of language? And as an economist, so if you, if you speak to general public groups that often visit the ECB even physically before Corona, it's really hard to find the right tone to speak to the local representatives of the rabbit growing association versus to the people from, from, uh, from, from the banking uh, society. So I think what you pointed out there is super important challenges uh, for us, also as, as economists talking to, to peers and, and to the public. But I'll leave it here. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah, Roberto, and Wolfgang. Uh, last round of discussion points now. Stefan, the floor is yours. This is a very uh, useful and very clear uh, overview in the book of economic developments in the euro area and of the various decisions adopted by the ECB's governing council. But the um, decision, I mean, the perspective is very much that of the ECB's very capable economic staff, and there's a lot of focus and modeling of sort of technical issues and technical problems and so on. For instance, there's very nice discussions of the complications that comes from managing monetary policy in an economy where you really have no past data and where the establishment of the central bank itself was a massive structural change. And there's a nice discussion on, for instance, the role the ECB played in the very rapid establishment of the ESM and the SSM, sort of the completion of missing institutions in the euro area that became obvious once the crisis hit and so on and uh, so forth. So there's a lot of sort of positive uh, in, in the sort of academic sense uh, as opposed to normative uh, sort of economics uh, sort of in here. But the book, I think, illustrates the unavoidable constraints that central bank staff face whenever they comment on monetary policy. They can't say that something was a mistake. They can't say that policymakers actually didn't understand what was going on for a while. And they can't say that some policy decisions were fudges uh, that had to be made. So policy is always seen as, as, opti as optimal. There's some hidden explanation that explains why it was exactly the right thing to do what they did. So my hunch is that uh, future economic historians will write very different books about these 20 years, and they will focus on very different things. They will focus on sort of the importance of different central banking histories, different central banking paradigms. They will focus on decision-making procedures, and they will focus on personalities. And what I would like to do here is give some illustration uh, of these things. So take, for instance, the ECB's famous two pillars, which is are discussed in the uh, in the in the book. Um, and I don't think actually I think the reference value that was not discussed, but there was a reference value early on and that was dropped. And then over time, as the authors discussed very clearly, the role of money growth was gradually replaced by the role of credit by credit instead. And the whole use of money. Uh, so also shifted. Initially, it was intended to be an indicator of risks to price stability. But over time, the authors argue quite correctly, to my view, that it became an indicator of, um, of uh, market tensions and risk to financial instability, risk of financial instability. 
So all of this happened because money growth was not a good indicator of inflation risks. It didn't work as planned. Uh, it was a mistake, if you like. So some, it was sort of another role was found for money. And I think, uh, or credit rather. So, and I think that's fair, but I think this money, money needs to be, money needs to keep in mind that this is a, this was a, this, this wasn't, a, this wasn't sort of something you should be proud of. This was something that sort of money was squeezed in, credit was squeezed in another way, but it actually didn't work the way it was intended to work. Now, why were these two pillars sort of adopted? Well, one story is that this was sort of an optimal outcome of something, but I don't, that's not the way I've heard the story. I thought the story was something like before the ECB was established and these issues were discussed in the European Monetary Institute. And in the European Monetary Institutes, you had representatives of all the European Union central banks, uh, including those that later on decided not to join uh, uh, EMU. And there was a tension because some countries, particularly Germany with the Bundesbank, was arguing that M3 targeting was the way to go. And the Bundesbank had been very successful with M3 targeting. And I think it's fair to say that at least up until 2007, 2008, I think money was informative for inflation in the euro area, but that changed thereafter. And then there was another view uh, championed by the countries that had inflation targeting, and they wanted to have something fresher, more modern, and they want to have inflation targeting. And this was just impossible to reconcile these two views. So this was set up, I think, as a fudge. Uh, we combined them in some way, and then we let history, or we let the future decide which will work best. Um, so this was not sort of an optimizing thing. It was, I, th I think, this was sort of sort of one of the many fudges that, I mean, policymakers, I mean, anyone who's been involved in policy knows that policy involves. Uh, I mean, the world is not perfect. I think Peter was very indicated this already. The world is not perfect. You have to make decisions under uncertainty. You have to come to agreement with people that is difficult, hard to forge agreements and so on and so forth. You know, it's it's like deciding where to go for a family dinner. The kids want to go someplace, the grandparents another place, the parents a third place. It's a, it's a big, it's a big mess. Now let's go to this other issue, which is also discussed in the book very clearly. And this is this whole issue. Was the ECB slow to change policy before the financial crisis? And there are a number of sort of technical explanations for why this, uh, for why this uh, happened. Uh, and I don't want to comment on those, but uh, what I would have thought was the obvious explanation is not discussed because they can't discuss it as being currently employees of the ECB. And that is, did this have something to do with the decision-making procedures of the governing council? So I think what went on was that early on in the ECB it was important to have a, a common view in the governing council. There were lots of people criticizing the ECB. Uh, there were lots of hostile commentary, particularly from the English speaking press, and it was important to sort of have a, a single common view, uh, either unanimity or consensus in making decisions. Now, as anyone who's, who's operated under consensus rules know, is that you achieve consensus when the minority has become so small that they realize that they are the minority, and then uh, because they're polite, they start to agree with majority view. So one way to think about that is that under consensus, the decision-making rule is not 50-50 or 50 need 51% to have your views imposed, but rather you need something more like two thirds or three quarters to have your view prevail. So one way of explaining that is to say that it means that policy changes are delayed until policy is so obviously misaligned that it has to be changed. So this, these decision-making procedures, I think, played a very important role in, in, in delaying ECB policy action, because policy was slow uh, early on. It was slow up until, I think in many ways, up until 2015. I think future economic historians will also talk about personalities, and that's also something the authors of this book cannot do, given their, their, their uh, positions at the, uh, at the ECB. So Jean-Claude Trichet, well, first we had uh, 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 Duesenberg, but then we had uh, President Trichet, 
and he was sort of a president in the years before the financial crisis. Remember, those were the years of the great moderation. There were no large shocks to economic activity. There were no large shocks uh, to inflation. So in comparison to what happened afterwards, this was an easy time to be, from an economic perspective, it was an easy time to be a central banker. But the ECB needed to establish itself as a credible central bank. It needed a president who would not be pushed around by phone calls from Minister of Finance or President of the Republic or minister, uh, Prime Ministers and so on. They needed sort of a person who could sort of embody the idea of a single currency, a single central bank for Europe and so on. And I thought Jean-Claude Trichet was perfect for that job. And I always felt he did a really good job being the person, uh, being uh, sort of Europe's Greenspan, uh, if you like. But then came the global financial crisis. And to my mind, I think like other central banks, the ECB was entirely overwhelmed uh, by these, and in fact made several mistakes, things that we know at least now were serious mistakes, uh, but we, uh, the authors here can't, can't, really, can't really talk about that for obvious reasons. So I think ex post, the interest rate increase in the summer of 2008, on the day that oil prices peaked with inflation at 4%, uh, two months, two and a half months before Lehman Brothers went belly up, well, that was really unfortunate. And the interest rate increases in, in the two increases in the spring of 2011, uh, I think with hindsight were really, uh, certainly were really unfortunate. And there were people already then in the governing councils who felt that this was not the good way to do. But I think these, um, these were mistakes. In the book, there is a long discussion of the so-called separation principle, which is the idea that ECB touted early on in the crisis, that you have two sets of policy instruments. You use interest rates to achieve sort of macroeconomic targets, objectives, and you use liquidity policy. You, pump, you can pump in extraordinary levels of liquidity to sort of calm financial markets and deal with financial instability uh, risk. And the book sort of says this is a very good idea. But my former governor, Patrick Honan, has argued in a PII uh, um, working pay for 2018, he said that this is, quotes, was a very, it was a seductive but analytically flawed policy. And he goes on to argue that that meant, the, this policy meant that the ECB was incapable to deal swiftly uh, with, the down, with the downdraft called by the financial crisis. The Fed adopted QE in 2008. I think, uh, and the ECB did it in 2015, seven years uh, later. Now that's a pretty serious problem. But then everything changed again because then came the household cavalry and Mario Draghi became president. Now he's a very sort of, he's an MIT educated uh, economist, very sure footed, uh, I think as an economist. And he had been lots of financial market experience from his time at Italian treasury, from Goldman Sachs. And then, of course, we had Peter Pratt, uh, with, uh, who's here, who replaced Jurgen Stark as chief economist. And I, I think future economic historians will say, thank God there was a change of players. The, the, uh, President Draghi and Peter were just much quicker at diagnosing the problems. That in many cases was sort of rooted in financial market and financial market sentiment, which they, of course, had experience with both having been in financial markets for a little while. And they were much quicker to think up imaginative new solutions and are much more willing to sort of try new things. And they acted much quicker. And that's why and Peter and, and, and President Draghi, I think the problems uh, were tackled very effectively. Uh, but it took a long, a long time. So in sum, I think this is an excellent analysis of the euro area economy and is an excellent analysis and description how the ECB's formidable economic staff thought about this, this, uh, uh, these developments. But it is a book that doesn't think, or doesn't want to dare, dare talk about policy makes even being possible. It doesn't talk about learning by doing, uh, which is actually very common in monetary policy. And it doesn't want to talk about sort of some policy decision not being the consequence of careful deliberations, but rather the need to make a decision 
now before the press conference starts in uh, in two hours. And I think I stopped there in, in the interest of time. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Stefan. This was clearly an interesting combination of, of views as an insider, a former vice governor of the Central Bank of Ireland, where you, of course, were a part of these decisions, at least, uh, you, you know, you were in many of these meetings. Uh, well, I was a fly on the wall. <laughs> yes, so that you're very <laughs> modest. <laughs> and and uh, as an academic who can be quite outspoken and also as a commercial bank chief economist who, despite being subject to compliance, can still open language, uh, I take uh, from this intervention. So I think um, uh, this is really a challenging task now for Roberto and for Wolfgang to reply. Uh, but, uh, you know, the floor is yours. Yeah, it was. It's getting interesting now. So very, very good. And uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe for exchange, I can, I can start, Roberto, if you may. Um, and uh, speaking openly, of course, I mean, what do you call it, Stefan? Unavoidable constraints central bank staff face when commenting on policy. Yes, and also in the book. I mean, we are technocrats, Roberto and I, and also Ross Massimo and and all the core of us. We are not uh, the ones who take the decisions. We are the ones who pre prepare the decisions. So. We had the privilege, I think, from all the books that could have been written about the 20 years of ECB monetary policy, we are in a special position. I think a lot of these things in the book could have only come from us because we have seen what type of econometric stuff, yield curve, back and forth could have done. It was only us to do it. Uh, we are not the ones who could have done all these interesting things that you mentioned, namely talk about personalities, uh, talk about um, what uh, was the role of having this particular leader in place and not the other one. I think there it's super interesting from people like you, from historians to hear that, also for us as staff to read it. But we had this very narrow focus in the book to see this was the situation, this was our analytics, this is how we thought, this is how it was channeled up there, conditional on the other things that you mentioned. And, um, and, and you're so right. And, and there's a host of others who can do that. And we try, at least in the book, two things. So we try to at least acknowledge that there was these critical voices. Also, the a bit the legacy thing when it came to the to the two pillars. You said there's a compromise between inflation targeting fans and, and money fans, and the two pillars was a kind of a, an amalgam to kind of make both sides happy. So I think legacy, at least, we we pick up. And on the critics, I mean, we try to have a bit of a, a mirror board with the CPR report that we kind of discuss along the ways. But I think this is the only uh, the we can only do so much in, in, in this in this in this direction. And uh, yeah, so let me stop here. I think it was was very useful uh, uh, to hear that. And, and of course, uh, a lot of critical comments and, and comments on other dimensions could be given elsewhere, but we just used our privilege to give this type of perspective that neither academics nor outside commentators could have done. But thanks so much, Stefan. Yeah. I think we need we need Peter to write his memoirs. Yeah, <laughs> we're looking forward. <laughs> Perhaps if I can add uh, something already. Um, well, I mean, let me take a bit of a different uh, view compared to Stefan, because I think we have been quite outspoken uh, in commenting on the decision of 2008 and especially 2011. Mm -hmm. And also what we do, we don't do it with the benefit of hindsight uh, and we show what was available back then to staff and to policymakers. Uh, take the decisions or different decisions. Then also on the separation principle, uh, uh, to be precise, perhaps let me quote page 209, uh, where we say that it proved uh, to be harmful uh, for the control uh, of uh, monetary policy. So I think we were not, uh, uh, I mean, might work well under normal conditions, but not uh, afterwards. Uh, then we didn't give uh, this perspective of uh, let's say being possibly slow or late because of a decision making process, but we cast it in what uh, we let's say know and what we can observe. Uh, there is more in terms of uh, uh, let's say high level principles. Uh, one could call it a, a model of reference. Uh, can be really a model with equations or the background that you mentioned or more of a monetary tradition, monetary tradition or not. So we try to highlight this different perspective and how each of them might have uh, shaped uh, and prevail uh, in this uh, battle of thoughts. Uh, 
uh, over time and I can stop here. No, oh, I mean, I think that's quite right. It, and you did a very good job, but it is it is the staff sort of uh, perspective and it's a very insightful uh, discussion about how the staff thought about it, but, but it is the staff's uh, perspective. Were we too slow? Uh, you have to consider the institution, the construction itself. So it's, I, I don't think it has really been the governing council consensus, uh, but for most people around the table to enter QE, this buying government bonds, because we did QE uh, before, but not for government bonds, in a monetary union without a fiscal union was extremely difficult. Uh, so it's not a question only of hawks and doves. It is really the institutional setting which was the biggest constraint. And certainly in my mind, so you try to push this this option, you know, as far as you can. And uh, the other thing uh, is uh, that I think the biggest, the biggest uh, failure, if I could say, um, is, and, and, and it's a, you can explain that because you didn't have, you know, supervision of banks, so you didn't have good information on that. But I think really to understand the transmission, what's going on on the transmission, you know, after the, the global financial crisis shock. I was in the second de decision in 2011 I voted in favor of an increase of rates. I just follow, I just entered. I mean, there was a second decision. I found it a little bit bizarre, but it was this sort of still, you know, you, you had, as a, very well explained in the book, this, this legacy, you know, about, you know, mastering the inflation expectation. You know, you, you come from the old regime, you know, of, you know, high inflation in some countries. So wages were starting to increase. A number of countries that still uh, index wages. And we, so that was taken in consideration, was, was not taken sufficiently, and also because of lack of information, was the other part, is the banking transmission mechanism, which was broken at that time already. So I, but I think, to, to be fair to the, to the authors of the book, this is well explained, I think, in the book, you see, they criticize very much the separation principle, they explain what it was, and then at some point they explain, you know, that, you know, this, this view is abundant. Sarah, uh, I think it's, it, hi, by the way, uh, good to see you at the ECB now. Um, we met before when you were at the Irish Central Bank, but on communication, uh, and I made the, the, the experience myself, but uh, it's not too difficult to communicate to the public about, you know, things like inflation, uh, that you try to lower the rates, you know, and, and the impact of the rates, you know, on, on consumption or whatever. That's not too difficult to explain, actually. Uh, although many people do not understand what is inflation in the general public, they have no clue about this. If you ask people on the street, what is much more difficult, and that's my my, my experience a few years ago, which came recently uh, on a German media, was how and was a brainstorming. So it was not really something we wanted to communicate. But and, and I asked you the question: How do you communicate on QE? That's a huge difference on QE, because when you push with people, I did the experience, but off the record, really here is that when you say that you, you print, actually, literally, trillions of money, uh, central bank money, and you have to explain that in two, three minutes, uh, and you print a huge amount of money, uh, and you buy bonds on the market. First, they don't know exactly what it means, but you give cash in exchange of something that people have. Uh, then people logically will ask you other questions. Why don't, why do you so much? What is the transmission of all that? Well, via financial conditions, via equity prices and all that, they say, well, but that's not what I have. So why don't you go into helicopter money? Uh, that's something you get very quickly. And then you, you, you say, yes, on paper, why not? You know, Philippe Martin, the French and, and colleagues have written that actually helicopter money is more efficient. The problem is the governance of all this, because when you start telling the public that, yes, indeed, it would, you know, push consumption up much faster than going via financial markets, uh, then they say, why, how, how do you calibrate that? And what, you know, how you, and, and that's very difficult to explain when you go into that. Uh, now, interest rate transmission is relatively easy. And you see that with the green. When the Bank of England says, no, I will exclude some firms, polluting firms from my, my portfolio, where do you stop there? Uh, and what do you do with the legacy portfolio and things like this? So uh, I, I just say, be careful about the communication to the public, especially when you do QE. When you are not in QE, it's easier, I would say. Sarah, do you want to comment because your uh, comments were directly addressed? <laughs> 
Um, yeah, no, I'm happy to, and I, I completely agree with Peter. I mean, I think it is a big challenge, and I think a lot of the, you know, kind of papers coming out on the topic now say that it's better for, you know, central banks to be communicating about the outcomes rather than the instruments, like that this is what's important to people. Um, to see where, where you're aiming to end up rather than the specific. But you get the question, Sarah. It's, yeah, I understand that. But you yeah. get the question from the public. I'm sorry, but you yeah. get the question. How no, do you do that said... concretely? How does it work, actually, your QE? Yeah. yeah so... Trillion, trillions. <laughs> so recently with the pandemic, actually, when I was in Ireland in the Monetary Policy Department in Ireland, we had a bit of an experience of that because one rather prominent journalist um, was writing that um, the central bank needs to print money. And this, you know, was on Twitter and there was a lot of like, oh, mm. why you too? Be done? And, um, you know, and it was difficult because, you know, you're trying to explain to people really that this is not a solution that would help. Um, in the same way that now communicating, you know, when prices are going up, why maybe it's not the best time to raise interest rates is a struggle. Um, so, yeah, I don't have any easy answers. And no, I think it's no, no, it's, it yeah. is not easy. Yeah. Yeah, no, but I completely agree with you. It's 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 a different ball game than communicating with financial markets for sure. Okay, we have used up time. Uh, last opportunity for Roberta and Wolfgang to say some final comments, words, concluding remarks. Well, no, really. Th thank you very much. Uh, it has been a very interesting debate, uh, and. Uh, uh, I really enjoy this really debate, uh, and thank you to the organizers to put together this uh, excellent panel. Yeah, thanks also from my side, Ernest and, and team, and thanks for 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 Stefan, Sarah, and, and Peter for this super interesting. It was really a discussion despite not being physically there, Peter. Uh, if it were like a paper academic conference type of thing, we would say thanks. We take it into account for the next revision. But this is a book, and, and the book is there. It's printed. <laughs> so we're not in the mood yet for for a second edition. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic has a lot in store to to be written about. But yeah, thanks for now. It was super interesting, and uh, also for our daily work, of course. Thanks. This concludes our webinar. Once again, congratulations to Robert, uh, to Roberto, Wolfgang, and co-authors for your brilliant book and for presenting and discussing it with us today. I take along two follow-ups. I'm expecting now volume two for the Roaring 2020s. <laughs> so you can, I'm sure you have started work already now. And I also take from the discussion that expectations are high for you, uh, Peter, to start working on your memoirs as a central banker, which we will be happy to present also in this series, of course. Awesome. Secrets, secrets. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much also to Peter, Sarah and Stefan for having shared with us your critical views. Thanks to all of you for participating today. With this, I close the meeting. Thanks to all. Bye-bye and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.